Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Cunningham. I am the equipment engineer in the Kansas Department of Transportation and also the chair of the oversight panel for EMTSP, which is Equipment Management Technical Services Program. Really appreciate you all taking the opportunity to log in and see what we have to offer here. The intent is to highlight the web-based training we have for fleet managers. Um, a lot of effort has gone into providing this training. There are, uh, we have, I believe it's five modules now with more coming. Um, those have been made possible by member states that have uh, voluntarily contributed into this uh, AASHTO technical services program. Uh, really want to recognize those states and thank them. I think at, at the last count, it's an annual uh, registration or, or payment into that program. Uh, last count, we had 43 states um, and it's a, a commitment every year. So uh, really want to thank those states. They've recognized the value of this program. We have an education committee that has volunteered to go through the content, provide content to um, proofread a lot of the uh, the training, help us steer it in the right direction. Want to recognize those folks, Tim Lawler from Maryland, Michael Ritz out of Virginia, Jeff Rados out of uh, Idaho, and and Nathan Luter, uh, Mississippi. Thank you very much, folks. Um, in addition, uh, EMTSP works with the National Center for Pavement Preservation, NCPP. Um, Dennis Halichoff and Neil Galehouse uh, are employees of NCPP, uh, and they do a lot of work in uh, in getting these this training um, put together, ready for the Education Committee to review. And so uh, a lot of thanks to those folks. And with that, I won't take any more time. I'm going to hand uh, this over to Neil Galehouse for him to start presentation. So uh, again, thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be with you today. Thank you, everyone, for we're getting on to be part of this webinar. I'm not going to leave my camera on just in the interest of uh, maintaining bandwidth here through the presentation, but I uh, wanted to take the opportunity to say hello to everybody. Thank you to Tim. Thank you to the Education Committee members of the EMTSP Oversight Panel. I um, want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Dennis Halichoff from our team. He's really uh, the leader in, in putting this together and is, is the subject matter expert for the development of this content. So the discussion today is really meant to give an overview of the web-based training program and some high points of each of the six training modules that have been developed so far. Uh, these courses were selected by the EMTSP oversight panel after a survey of fleet managers at DOTs across the country. Um, after discussing the courses, I'm going to go through the process that can be followed to access these courses on the AASHTO TC3 site, which is where you will go if you want to take those. Uh, as I run through the training course information, it should be noted, and it is noted in the modules, that agency policies and practices may differ from the, the information that's presented in the courses. This is just a general overview and general practices is a guide that should be followed, but um, specific agency practices may differ from that. So the first course that's been developed in uh, the web-based training program is preventive maintenance concepts for state equipment fleet operations. So when we say prevent preventative maintenance or PM, what do we mean? This is the work of keeping something in proper condition. It's a series of planned maintenance activities that focus on preventing unplanned equipment failures, downtime, and related preventable costs. So it involves the use of a systematic and proactive schedule of work in which the agency will provide inspection, detection, and correction of deficiencies, which may include equipment checks cleaning, adjustment, fluid changes, lubrication, and partial or complete equipment overhauls at specified periods. 
These work actions are performed on a time or machine operated schedule, such as number of miles, hours used, or gallons of fuel consumed as examples. It could also be based on onboard alerts or sensor notifications that are proactive in nature. These work actions are aimed at sustaining or extending the useful life of equipment by reducing degradation to an acceptable level. So why is it important for an agency to implement a fleet equipment PM program? First, the course talks about how it allows the agency to maximize equipment availability and utilization while reducing fleet ownership, maintenance, and operating costs. Second, it allows the agency to maximize equipment life expectancy and meet or exceed the equipment design life, as well as the correlated reduction of unproductive downtime on the job site. The PM program also ensures that the equipment is in a safe operating condition which is going to reduce the injury risk to the operator and the public, as well as reducing the liability by the agency, uh, resulting from potential claims of negligence. Finally, the course talks about how a well-executed PM program is characterized by a high number of scheduled and proactive work orders versus unscheduled reactive maintenance or repair work. As a result of this, shop employees can increase productivity and complete scheduled maintenance activities faster. The course goes on to talk about the basic elements of an effective PM program. And these include a checklist of preventive maintenance service tasks to be performed, uh, establishment of what these preventative maintenance service intervals are, a record of operator inspections and our complaints, which are used to assist the fleet mechanic in identifying and repairing deficiencies prior to breakdown. Having an adequate equipment maintenance facility that is capable of performing uh, the necessary PM activities. Having trained professional technicians either in-house or commercially outsourced uh, to perform PM inspections. Formalized process for work scheduling and record keeping. This could be uh, either manual or electronic, but the course stresses the value of an electronic uh, process versus a manual one. And finally, access to sufficient PM supplies, petroleum products, shop tools, and OEM publications. The course covers scheduling PM intervals, uh, determining factors that should be taken into account when establishing these schedules include uh, work type, equipment utilization rate, the work environment of the equipment, such as dusty or muddy conditions, vehicle mileage or elapsed time, engine hours, manufacturer's recommendations, uh, mechanic and maintenance bay availability, distance of the equipment from the nearest uh, fleet maintenance facility, and the ease of reaching that facility. The course stresses that PM intervals and tasks should be based on OEM recommended practices and carefully adjusted to match the demands of harsh or severe operating use and conditions where they occur. The course goes on to talk about leveraging automation and PM scheduling and work order generation. Uh, automated fuel transaction systems have the ability to facilitate an update of the PM schedule when interfaced with the PM module of the agency's computerized fleet management system. Most current uh, computerized fleet management systems can schedule PM activities on the basis of miles, hours, elapsed time, or fuel consumed. So this technology eases the complexity of PM scheduling, order generation, work order documentation, and operator notification. Additionally, the software provides a way to gather timely reports on all aspects of a PM program. Minimally, you know, this computerized fleet management system should enable an agency to create customized PM schedules, create and track work orders, utilization, uh, and fuel usage, as well as record detailed maintenance histories, including uh, things such as tire usage, um, tire issue logs, and incidents of unscheduled repairs, and comeback or return repairs. The system should also be able to track accident and incident claims, 
manage lubricant and part inventories, monitor labor hours and trends, and invoicing. As a result, the fleet manager is able to quickly and accurately monitor fleet condition and make timely, proactive decisions. Finally, the course touches on the tools for measuring, recording, and analyzing PM program performance. It stresses that fleet managers should utilize ad hoc reporting tools provided in the fleet management system or fleet maintenance management system or spreadsheet software uh, and other dashboard reporting tools to develop performance charts and metrics. These tools are important resources to be used when measuring and reporting on PM program and fleet maintenance facility performance. Areas of opportunity for improvement may include review and analysis of PM work to confirm that the work was completed on that scheduled on-time basis. Uh, measure and document that policies, procedures, and practices are being complied with. Uh, and analyze and measure the, pre the PM program and procedures are producing the expected results. For example, is the agency experiencing decreased equipment downtime, reduced machine maintenance costs, extended machine life cycle, or increased oper operator satisfaction with equipment operability? So moving on to the second course in the series, which is uh, be benchmarking and best practices for state equipment fleet management. Uh, this course begins by talking about the importance of fleet performance management, which gives insight as to the health of the equipment fleet. During periods of economic downturn, uh, agency equipment fleets often experience fiscal and operational constraints. Resources are scarce and budgets might need to be justified and defended. Sometimes decisions are made for the short term that are not in the long term interest of the fleet. The fleets often undergo reductions in equipment inventory and staffing. There is increased public and legislative press pressure to privatize some or all of the fleet's functions. In this climate, the, the fleet manager has to work diligently to maximize fleet output and reduce cost. Maximum productivity at the lowest cost, coupled with sound financial decision-making tools and documentation are really essential. The course discusses how performance metrics provide an objective way to communicate the fleet's story. Performance metrics are a quantifiable and repeatable standard of measurement that provides the fleet manager greater credibility when explaining operations or requests to senior management, elected officials, and the public. Uh, examples of performance metrics include average maintenance cost per equipment class, percentage of the fleet meeting minimum utilization standards, and total hours of equipment repair downtime. So what are the benefits of performance management? Why is an agency going to want to do this? The performance management concept is one that really assists the organization in moving itself where it wants to go. The data created by a performance management system provides quantitative feedback to agency employees, managers, legislators, and the public as to how well they're performing. Having quantitative data provides greater credibility and weight than producing subjective information. It also provides greater transparency when reported to legislators and the public through a performance dashboard on a website. You know, providing this transparency can lead to greater trust when the agency shows the ability to improve performance or deliver programs with a higher level of proficiency. The course goes on to cover three fundamental components of performance management. Uh, the first component of that is strategic planning, which sets the long range direction for the organization. Most well-run organizations have developed a strategic plan. From this plan, managers make decisions on how to allocate resources to pursue the long range strategy. Second component is performance management system. So system is capturing and reporting on progress towards identified goals. Ideally, the data is reported routinely to provide short-term feedback to employees and managers alike. This is going to allow the organization to understand whether it's progressing towards its long-range objective and 
provide data that defines how far it has progressed. The third component is connecting results to process improvement. When the actual results experience a shortfall to identified goals, there needs to be a mechanism in place to change the way things are done to reach those long-term objectives. And so through performance improvement, managers are, managers are able to identify the root cause of problems and improve the operation by providing or adjusting the necessary tools, training, procedures, or staffing. So when we think about performance management and metrics, one of the first questions that comes to mind is what to measure. The course talks about how metrics fall into three broad categories. And those are inputs, activities, and outcomes. Uh, an input is a resource used by the organization to accomplish its objectives. Examples for an agency include labor, money, uh, equipment, parts, and fuel. Uh, an activity is a completed service or product produced. Well, for an equipment fleet, examples of activities include uh, percentage of PM services performed on time, uh, number of equipment repairs completed, and uh, number of parts lines stocked. So an outcome is an effect produced for the agency as a whole or for the public. For a fleet manager, outcomes would be the effect of its inputs and activities for the benefit of the agency or the public. So those examples would include equipment availability, utilization, percentage of total repairs that are scheduled repairs, uh, percentage of equipment operating within the established life cycle, productivity among operating units that utilize fleet equipment and uh, equipment operator satisfaction. Looking at uh, AASHTO specifically and, and EMTSP, the, the AASHTO Maintenance Committee passed a resolution in 2012 adopting four DOT fleet performance metrics that were of national importance. Uh, those measures were preventive maintenance, utilization, uh, equipment re retention, uh, equipment availability or downtime. Uh, and finally, uh, a fifth has been added on uh, unscheduled repairs occurring between PM intervals. Uh, so since that time, EMTSP and state DOT equipment fleets have been involved in a multi-year program to report data on these performance measures and develop threshold values. And the program's intent is to provide a forum for agencies to view, compare, and learn from their peer agencies, as well as provide a picture of national equipment fleet performance. And so that information is available on the EMTSP website. So when a program identifies performance metrics to use and captures that data, what are they supposed to do with it? When a performance gap is identified through the benchmarking process, this means the difference between the actual result and the identified goal. The first step is to analyze that information and try to identify the cause or causes of the gap. Uh, by discussing results with other organizations included in the benchmark, that cause might become clear. For example, other agencies may come complete unscheduled repairs faster because they have a parts inventory on hand where your agency maintains minimal inventory. But if the cause is not clear from these discussions, further examination should be undertaken internally to identify those causes. Once the cause of the performance gap is identified, fleet managers should work to develop strategies for improvement. Second step in the process is to integrate results within the agency. The time spent in performing benchmarking and identifying performance gaps does no good if the results aren't used to improve performance. The findings from the benchmarking process and strategies for improvement should be communicated to all levels within the agency, including your fleet technicians, your supervisors, and agency management. Once the findings have been communicated, improvement goals should be created for the fleet and the agency. So the third step in the process is to initiate action. In this step, 
uh, action plans should be developed that are based upon the results of the analysis performed in step one. Specific action should be implemented that will help achieve the improvement goals created in step two. Once the actions have been implemented, progress should be monitored by continued benchmarking. Moving on to the third training course in the series, it's establishing core equipment complements and the optimal sizing of state equipment fleets. To start out this course, uh, there's a discussion of how to identify the optimal equipment fleet size. The term right sizing has become the suggested strategy for squeezing greater cost efficiencies out of fleet assets without diminishing service levels to customers. The term right sizing, however, is more than simply utilizing smaller displacement engines or overall vehicle size. The reality is it involves establishing the optimal number of properly specified assets that are available and work ready for the agency fleets to fulfill their mission. So the course focuses on overall optimal fleet sizing and the establishment of core com equipment complements, which is the proper selection of primary equipment types and quantities that are critical to performing those core mission driven activities of the agency. The optimal number of assets is really no more or less than is required to properly support the organization's mission and customers. Course stresses that optimal fleet sizing is not just about maintaining the right number of vehicles and equipment items and in inventory, but also selecting the optimal vehicle and equipment items in terms of numbers, class, capabilities, and technical specifications. So the first step in the process is determining the required core equipment complements, meaning equipment compositions, types, and numbers that are required and should be owned to ensure that the mission is met and the prescribed levels of service are delivered as effectively and efficiently as possible. Typically, this includes equipment that is needed to support daily operations, emergency response, essential winter operations, and typical highway maintenance work. This equipment normally has high criticality ranking and is not readily available for rent or lease. Additionally, core equipment complements include specially designed and constructed equipment that performs unique functions or programs, such as your truck mounted attenuators, your highway striping equipment, and bridge inspection equipment. Optimal fleet sizing is also a means of determining what equipment fleet items do not need to be owned. Those that can be sourced in an alternative manner without sacrificing mission or levels of service. The necessity of establishing the makeup of core equipment complements and the larger task of determining optimal fleet size is driven by ensuring appropriate fleet asset composition, mix, equipment capabilities relative to the task, technical specifications, assignment methodology, and quantity. A development of strategic business plan, which addresses organizational business and risk perspectives, provides guidance on what circumstances warrant the rental or lease of equipment versus uh, owned as core fleet assets. Achieving the proper equilibrium between fleet inventory and defined levels of service is difficult at best because the task of optimizing the overall equipment fleet size is never a one-time job. Rather, that is a continuous process. So what are the defined mission and programs that drive the agency? The answer to this question really involves sitting down with a group of agency decision makers including your agency executives, senior level and mid-level managers, department heads, fleet managers, budget and procurement officers, and other agency stakeholders. During this meeting, the agency should develop and establish that baseline, which involves arriving at an understanding of what the agency's core mission and functions entail. In other words, what activities drive and define the agency's use of equipment. For example, in some states, this may be winter maintenance activities encompassing your snow and ice removal. While for others, this may involve roadside mowing and vegetative management activities. 
from here, the agency needs to conduct a complete and partial cost analysis of these self-performed core activities. This cost analysis should recognize all the internal costs required to deliver these activities versus outsourced contractor costs, including existing contractor availabilities and capabilities, as well as internal contract management or oversight costs for the contract. In order to ensure that these calculations are correct, fleet managers have to be able to produce accurate costs for the equipment and services it provides. These internal costs must be accounted for and allocated to the core activities self-performed by the agency. So the course covers determining baseline equipment complements for core functions and activities. The point stressed here is that each agency begins the optimization process with a given fleet size. From this starting point, each agency has to identify the core functions that drive their operation and develop a baseline composition of required equipment types and classes to perform their mission-driven functions and activities. Uh, agency equipment needs are controlled by what activities the agency self-performs. Keeping in mind that the equipment can be owned, leased, rented, or borrowed. Uh, these equipment needs will vary based on factors such as differences in population density, terrain, and climatic conditions. The course notes that core agency functions change over time and vary between urban and rural areas. Uh, activity frequency and volume influence these decisions, but so do contractor and equipment availability as well as their capabilities and associated costs. In anticipating the future, agencies should be proactively exploring out-of-the-box options, such as contracting some or all of its core activities to local agencies or the private sector. During this process, topics such as fully operated equipment rental, short-term rental, leasing, outright purchase, and the total cost of ownership programs, uh, retention of fleet maintenance staff, and associated infrastructure to support fleet maintenance should be discussed. There really shouldn't be anything that's off the table from consideration. In establishing this list of core equipment complements, it's important to note that the makeup of agency fleets will vary due to organizational uniqueness, management philosophy, structure, operating environments, and the availability of sound fleet data. In developing equipment complements, there are some suggested actions that are important as the optimization process is implemented. First, the agency should verify the targeted long-term level of service and performance goals for mission-driven activities. From there, the agency should develop a demonstrative fleet asset inventory required to support the identified mission-driven activities. The agency should also strive to determine the utilization history and remaining service life patterns of the identified fleet assets, including examination of fleet asset life cycles, replacement costs, and the economic analysis of repair, rebuild, refurbish, and replace or not replace. At the same time, a high performing fleet will conduct fleet condition assessment of these identified fleet assets determine any existing failure occurrences such as high levels of corrosion. A tangible product for this process should be a fleet asset management plan which optimizes capital fleet investments and best fleet funding strategies. The course goes on to cover the fundamentals of optimal fleet size. The overall goal of optimal fleet sizing is to provide support to agency operations as efficiently as possible. When determining optimal fleet size, fleet managers need to consider four key areas. Fixed costs resulting from the ownership and management of fleet assets. These costs include depreciation, insurance, and overhead costs. Fixed costs are driven directly by fleet population. Variable costs, on the other hand, include fuel, preventive maintenance, and repair costs. Therefore, in order to reduce or eliminate unnecessary costs, fleet managers must manage both the number of assets, but also their utilization. Managed fleet utilization can reduce both fixed and variable fleet costs. 
attributes such as reliability, capacity, productivity, availability, and unscheduled breakdowns impact utilization. Therefore, failing to optimize equipment quality attributes reduces utilization, which results in retaining unnecessary fleet assets. Finally, the course covers identifying equipment types and quantities needed to support agency core activities. To ensure achievement of core activities, construction and maintenance forces must be equipped with the right equipment at the right time and in adequate numbers. The course stresses that the proper management of these equipment fleet assets is very important and can provide a significant cost reduction for state highway agencies. Agency divisions and fleet management must be able to jointly agree upon equipment types and quantities required to perform a particular activity and jointly develop a fleet asset inventory that reflects that. From there, they should work to slowly implement, test, and document the results from these initial assumptions over a defined period of time. It's recommended that any type of implementation begin in one district or region at a time where managers can learn, document results, refine, and then adjust those before moving on to the next. Finally, it's imperative that results be shared with agency leadership and other stakeholders. The fourth training course in the web-based training series is on equipment specifications, concepts and tools for state equipment fleets. For this course, the content begins by discussing the importance of equipment specifications to a fleet manager. One of the primary responsibilities of a fleet manager is to ensure that the fleet has the right mix of equipment and that the equipment is utilized optimally. The fleet manager has the fiduciary responsibility to operate and manage the equipment fleet in an efficient and effective manner. The scheduled and planned replacement of fleet assets is an integral element of this responsibility. Equipment specifications provide a component by component description of the vehicle or equipment item that is to be used as a tool to perform a specific task. In order to achieve the goals of planned or, or scheduled fleet replacement, the specification writer needs to have a continued awareness of the agency's budget position, future budget constraints, fiscal year date cycles, contract award dates, and the associated renewal due dates of current working contracts. Having this knowledge and foresight allows the specifications to be written well in advance so that there's no lapse in the agency's ability to procure equipment. The course goes on to present the three types of specifications, which are design specifications, performance specifications, and hybrid specifications. The course also presents the differences that exist between public sector and private sector uh, specifications. It's important to understand that the differences are largely due to the mandates under which they operate. So for private sector companies, they have to make a profit in order to survive. The private sector fleet manager has significant flexibility to evaluate potential purchase alternatives. And their final buying decision is based in part on his or her best judgment uh, and company business practices. Conversely, the public sector fleet manager is typically required by state law to accept the lowest bid that meets the technical specification. This puts more pressure on the state DOT fleet manager or specification writer to assemble as many best assessments and judgments into the technical specification document as possible. Taking a look at state procurement and ethics laws, it's the duty of the state procurement office to promote both product and price competition. In doing so, it requires that the specification be as non-restrictive as practical and consistent with satisfying legitimate needs. Typically, the procurement office has that final responsibility and authority for the competitiveness and suitability of equipment specifications. They're also responsible for final editing of the specifications and ensuring the clarity of the language it contains. 
state procurement office assists and provides guidance to the specification writer on state procurement and administrative rules relevant to the development of the specifications and the select selection of the solicitation method. In most cases, however, the state procurement office does not have that expertise in every sphere of DOT programs and equipment requirements to write the actual specification. But it does have the expertise to keep the specification writer out of administrative career or legal peril. Therefore, throughout the specification development, procurement and acquisition process, that close collaboration is essential. So it's incumbent on the DOT fleet manager, the specification writer, and members of the fleet staff that they're thoroughly trained and understand how their respective states procurement and ethics laws, uh, including those statutes, regulations, codes, rules, and administrative processes apply to them as they interact with the vendor community and others to write equipment specifications, which are the basic element of the procurement process. The solicitation development phase talks about how the procurement officer selects the appropriate procurement or solicitation me method, which will dictate the type of technical specification document to be used. Commonly, the procurement method selection is based upon the scope of work, equipment type, quantity, uh, expected cost of the procurement action, feasibility of preparing complete specifications at the outset of the requirement uh, definition and whether or not price alone or price plus other criteria such as quality should determine the selection among qualified suppliers. Selection of the procurement process provides format and technical direction to the specification writer as to how to complete the technical specification document. During this phase, the solicitation language and contractual requirements for the purchase are developed and the solicitation contract is created. From these selection decisions, bids are evaluated and the winning supplier is contracted. Culmination of this phase is, is the selection of the supplier to fulfill the contract. There are typically three procurement or solicitation methods used in the procurement of DOT equipment, which are a request for quotation, RFQ, invitation to bid or invitation for bid, and finally, uh, request for proposals, RFP. Our course goes on to discuss each one of these procurement methods in detail. One of the emerging solicitation methods that's discussed in the course is best, val best value procurement method, sometimes called best value bid approach. Best value procurement considers factors other than price when determining which product will provide the best overall value in a bidding environment. This approach requires a specification writer to research and compare operating performance parameters, including total cost of ownership, extended warranties, post-delivery dealer support, and equipment performance uh, or productivity for competing equipment items, and list all that are important to the application and the specification. Specification should provide an acceptable range for each parameter offered by an appropriate equipment item. Considerations such as life cycle cost analysis, productivity over life, guaranteed buyback, warranty, free loan machines, operating costs, market share, resale values, dealer locations, and associated skill level of technical employees are things that can also be included in the best bet best value procurement approach. Evaluating the bid requires conscientious weighing of each specified parameter, awarding more points for equipment features with higher performance and fewer points for features that perform to a lesser degree. As with the low bid approach, any asset that does not meet the minimum point range for each specified parameter is then rejected as unacceptable. The course also covers the pre-bid and post-award conferences. Uh, pre-bid conference is a meeting held by the procurement officer and the specification writer with potential bidders prior to the closing of that solicitation. The purpose here is to answer questions, clarify ambiguities, respond to general issues, and to establish an understanding of all the technical requirements of the solicitation. This results in better 
potential bidder understanding of the solicitation requirements, technical specifications, and reduce delays in contract award. Typically, the time, date, and locations of the pre-bid conference is announced in the solicitation. The post-award conference is a meeting held by the procurement officer, specification writer, and the awarded bidder to review the awarded contract and technical specification. The objective of this meeting is to ensure that the selected contractor or vendor has a clear understanding of contract and specification requirements. This understanding should translate into the delivery of equipment that is specification compliant and on time. Finally, the course covers acceptance procedures for equipment. This really covers the inspection and testing methods used by the agency to ensure delivered equipment meets specifications, is free of workmanship issues, is work ready, and acceptable for payment. And it stresses these procedures must be documented. The length of inspection time required by the agency should also be included in the contract. Other suggested clauses for acceptance include what to do if corrective action is required, how much additional time is allowed for further inspection, a responsibility for transporting the equipment from, from uh, the equipment or, or to the vendor and, and back to the department and delayed deliveries. For testing, performance requirements must be repeatable, definable, and quantifiable. Everybody should understand how results are going to be measured. For example, if a snowblower is required to blow 3,500 tons of snow per hour, or if a sweeper is required to pick up three yards of moist sand and leave less than 2% behind. Uh, testing cl clauses should address the consequences of the equipment. Failing the test and whether a retest is going to be permitted. For example, a reduction in the price paid if a minor loss of performance is permissible or outright cancellation of the contract if a major failure occurs. Uh, the course also covers that if performance uh, testing should be done with a skilled operator, not a salesman, which eliminates the argument that the machine was not operated properly. Moving on, the fifth course in the series is utilization management concepts for state equipment fleets. So in this course, it begins by talking about the importance of utilization management. Equipment fleet operations affect the agency's ability to effectively perform routine activities to effectively respond to emergency events. Now, today, the typical state DOT has annual equipment related expenditures approaching $80 million. The new physical and operating norm is one of continuing scarce resources that must be routinely and vigorously defended, quantitatively justified, and judiciously managed. To be successful in this environment, the fleet manager has to have the knowledge and creative solutions to manage and maximize fleet performance with reduced fleet population and corresponding capital and operating budget. Optimized fleet asset utilization coupled with productivity performance at the lowest cost and sound decision making are essential. So what is the optimal fleet size? As I mentioned earlier, the optimal number is the minimum number of assets needed to effectively deliver the mission of the organization. Any equipment item not fulfilling its justified purpose and use is fair game for reallocation or elimination from the fleet altogether. Now, the total number of assets in a fleet directly drive the overall cost structure of that fleet. There's no such thing as a free fleet asset, emergency or essential fleet items notwithstanding. Optimal fleet utilization is not only about managing fleet asset use during defined economic life cycles. It's also the management of maintaining the right number of equipment items in inventory, as well as about selecting the optimal asset items in terms of number, class, technical specification, and capabilities. Uh, for example, the use of multi-purpose assets where, when and where possible. The course stresses the importance of managing fleet items as depreciating assets. Failure to recognize equipment items as depreciating assets is a common challenge. As an example, many agencies wouldn't think twice about leasing copiers, but might balk at the opportunity to lease fleet assets. 
The same financial principles apply regardless of whether they're talking about a copier or a piece of highway equipment. They're both examples of depreciating assets. A common mistake for public fleets is the failure to recognize the total cost to the agency's operation. For example, it's not uncommon for a vehicle to sit idle under the guise that the vehicle will be needed in the future. When asked why anyone would allow a depreciable asset to sit idle, you know, many government employees rationalize that there are no costs because the vehicle is owned. The principle that depreciating assets are always worth more today and less tomorrow often go unnoticed. And fortunately, when examining costs associated with idle assets, it's common to find most assets are still tracked in a database, insured against damage, and parked on real estate. All of the activities associated with idle assets consume resources and cost budget dollars. Therefore, the failure of not actively managing individual asset usage uh, with a coordinated replacement plan or schedule that's aligned to its defined life cycle will result in higher life cycle costs. Managing fleet replacement by man managing utilization involves performing asset life cycle analysis and the establishing replacement criterion that enables the fleet managers to evaluate, forecast, plan, and manage new fleet equipment purchases many years out. This helps ensure that equipment will be retained in the fleet for a defined period of time and will be utilized at a managed rate to achieve its planned economic life. The purpose of a multi-year fleet replacement plan is to identify long-term spending needs and associated budgetary requirements. This long-range plan is a best practice and is supported by basic elements, including maximizing warranty coverage and equalizing and maximizing uh, asset usage. Ideally, the utilization performance of a fleet asset should align with the agency's defined replacement criteria for the asset and long-term fleet capital and replacement schedules. As an example, if a fleet has a defined replacement criteria of 10 years and 120,000 miles, then the usage of this asset needs to be managed to obtain an annual usage of 12,000 miles for each year of the 10 years and on schedule for its funded and planned replacement in year 10. The course then goes on to talk about a formal utilization review. The objective is not only to identify underutilized assets, but, but also to offer alternative means of providing uh, sourcing equipment and ownership. Examples of alternative sourcing includes uh, personal owned vehicle mileage reimbursement, downsizing to less expensive and more economical equipment units, uh, centralized in departmental pooling, sharing equipment with other public agencies, leasing equipment, and the use of commercial equipment or vehicle rental companies. In the experience of many fleet experts, a fleet that has not been previously exposed to the scrutiny of an in-depth utilization study can typically be downsized by five to 15%. The benefits derived from such an initial study include a reduction in the total size of the fleet, one-time income generated from the sale of surplus vehicles and equipment, and ongoing savings for the annual operating and maintenance costs associated with those removed units. The course presents characteristics common among successful fleet utilization management programs, including a champion of the program within the organization, supportive executive level leadership and management, the use of performance measures that guide decision making, fleet data which exhibits high levels of accuracy and integrity, a preservation first strategy for fleet management priorities, and investment principles based on life cycle cost analysis and return on investment, and the ability to analyze options in use opportunities to privatize functions and alternatively source fleet assets. The important responsibility of the fleet manager is to develop a long-term systematic fleet management program that is intended to stabilize the annual procurement funding required for an efficient and effective fleet. In doing so, the utilization management program is going to enable the fleet manager to successfully forecast the replacement of assets while reducing maintenance costs in the long term. 
Utilization management plan should be based on functional needs, best value, cost, investment return, thereby optimizing the value of these assets. A well-managed fleet utilization program supports and sets in place a predictable and expe expected annual equipment replacement program. Continued focus to op optimally size the overall fleet and integral core equipment fleet complements to ensure that there's an appropriate mix and quantity of equipment that is available, work ready, and in place. Finally, the course covers standardizing equipment, vehicles, components, and specifications. Standardizing refers to the narrowing of fleet composition to a few equipment makes, models, or critical components. By doing so, the agency can increase efficiency and save money on parts inventory, training, and repairs. Standardization allows fleets to readily rotate fleet assets to manage utilization and maintain planned replacement schedules and budgets. In consideration moving an agency towards standardization is that the fleet may be particularly vulnerable in the event of a recall or major warranty issue. In some cases, a standardized fleet's relationship with its manufacturer may give it access and priority to replacement parts quickly. Conversely, the situation can lead to major downtime accumulations, increased equipment rental costs, and customer dissatisfaction. The sixth and final course uh, completed to date is uh, State Procurement and Disposal, Concepts for State DOT Equipment Fleets. This course has not yet been developed by TC3, as is the case with the other courses. So this is one that should be available sometime early next year. The course begins with a discussion on the goal of public procurement. Uh, procurement personnel are positioned in a rapidly changing environment of emerging technologies, diversity of products and solutions, environmental issues ranging from green buying to recycled products, uh, the need for quality products and services and awards based upon best value to the agency rather than lowest price. The primary goal of public procurement is to award timely and cost effective contracts to qualified contractors, suppliers, and service providers for the provision of goods, work, and services to support government agencies and public service operations in accordance with principles and procedures established in the individual state public procurement statutes, laws, codes, and rules. The course goes on to talk about the difference between procurement and acquisition. Procurement is a management philosophy that places emphasis on outcomes and benefits, uh, employs risk management techniques, and requires that roles and responsibilities be clearly defined for the supplier, the procurement department, and the government entity. Acquisition is defined as the act or process of acquiring. Acquisition includes all actual and administrative processes and labor incurred by the buyer in the process of acquiring goods and services. These functions and processes can be quantified as total acquisition costs, which may include all applicable indirect labor and overhead costs. From there, the course discusses various purchasing methods such as term contracts, price list contracts, vendor list contracts, long-term contractors, and cooperative purchase agreements. In terms of disposal, the state surplus property office manages the sale and disposable disposal of surplus state property, as well as the sale and distribution of federal government property, equipment, and vehicles to government agencies, qualified nonprofit entities, and the public. All property owned by the state that has been declared as surplus is required to be disposed of by the state surplus property office. The state surplus property programs also obtain various surplus items, mainly from federal sources such as military bases, federal facilities, and the General Services Administration. For your reutilization by state and county agencies and others, uh, the program promotes and facilitates the sustainable reuse of state-owned and federally-owned surplus property to other state and local governments, qualifying nonprofit entities, generally identified by the term donees, and the public. For those qualified donee programs, 
The federal surplus property program acquires surplus federal properties such as vehicles and heavy equipment, boats, furniture, aircraft, and so on for eligible state agencies, universities, local governments, public schools, and other nonprofit organizations. Donee program eligibility determines if an organization is eligible to require this federal and state surplus property. The program is completely supported by the revenues generated from a nominal service charge that is administered to cover the cost of the program. This means that program costs are passed on to participants in the form of service fees that vary according to the condition of the item, demand, and sale price. Program participants are typically referred to as these donees since the property is considered a donation from the federal government. Finally, the course covers common equipment disposal methods. This list includes equipment brokers, guaranteed repurchase programs, trade in on the purchase of newer used units, sealed bid, public auction, transferred within the agency, negotiated sale to another governmental agency, parts removed with the remainder sold as scrap, donated to a nonprofit organization, and sale or consignment to equipment dealers. So that covers the content in the six courses that we've developed to date. I just quickly, I know we're short on time, I just want to run through some of this process and how to access the training within ASHTO TC3. So these courses are available free of charge to any state DOT provided that you sign in with your governmental email. And so to do that, the first step is to go to the EMTSP website, which is www.emtsp.org. Uh, there is a uh, training tab at the top of the screen, as you see, and right below that is, is a sort of sub tab or link uh, for the EMTSP web-based training. So you'll go ahead and click on that, and you'll be taken to the following screen. Each completed course that's available within TC3 uh, is listed here on the screen with sort of an overview of uh, the course content. Down at the bottom for each course, there is a link there that you will click to be taken to TC3. Uh, so this next screen on the TC3 website has a description of the course, and you'll have the option there on the right side of the screen uh, to, cl to click and add that to your training cart. From there, you will uh, click on the cart and hit the go to cart button on the right side of your screen. And then you will be prompted to log in with your state government email address. And I'll add this, all of these courses are available to you regardless of whether your state participates in the TC3 program or not. You have a governmental email address you should be able to log in if there's issues in doing so you know please feel free to reach out to somebody within emtsp whether that's uh, tim cunningham or myself or dennis halichoff you know reach out to us and we will help ensure that you're able to get in and access uh, this content so once you've logged in, uh, you'll see the following screen, and then you'll be able to verify the cost is zero on the right side of the screen and proceed to the checkout on the bottom right. Then you'll review the information uh, on the screen and click review order. Once you've reviewed that you have the proper training in your cart, uh, you will click on place order. From there, the next page is going to show you your receipt, and there will be a My Training link on the screen. When you're ready to proceed with taking the training itself, click on that link. And the link will take you to the My Training folder, and all of the courses that you've signed up for will be available. From there, to launch the training module, uh, click on the one that you would like to open, and there will be a uh, button on the right side of your screen to launch that training and begin. Just quickly, for those, anybody on the call that is not a DOT participant, meaning a local agency consultant or other group, um, you still have the ability 
to take this training material. Um, it is not offered free of charge as it is for uh, state DOT members. The pricing you have to take the training, the standard rate is $50 per instructional hour. So for each course, when you're in the TC3 checkout process, it's gonna tell you how long each course is and the cost will be at that $50 rate. Uh, most of the courses within the web-based training program are gonna be between two and three hours in length. Uh, these rates are set by the ASHTO TC3 program. This is not a cost that's being passed on by EMTSP. There's no revenue from this that's being generated to EMTSP or anything like that. Um, but alternatively, uh, if you're at a local agency or consultant, your group can enroll in, in one of these two pricing options that may fit better with your needs and may save some funds versus paying uh, a straightforward $50 an hour for each and every course you take. Those are these unlimited price per person or uh, an optional bulk hour price. And all of that is arranged through the TC3 program. So uh, if there's questions regarding that, um, that would be something that you would have to address with them. So that's really the conclusion of the presentation today. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them or, or Dennis or Tim. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me offline or if you have an issue down the road, feel free to reach out to me and I'll follow up to assist you however I can. Um, so that's the, that's the conclusion of my presentation. If you have any questions uh, before we end today, feel free to enter those in the question box and we'll try to see that we can answer those. I see one, this is Dennis. Uh, okay. The question was, will there be a copy of this presentation available? Well, we are recording the session today, and I believe that is something we could make available on the EMTSP on website. Yeah, that yes. would be my preference. And so if, if yeah. we can make that happen, Dennis Tang, that would be great. So yeah, once Excellent. this is concluded, it'll be recorded and we'll try and post it on the emtsp.org website. That, that website's an important one for folks that may not be familiar with it. There are a lot of good resources there. That's where most of our work happens. One of our main objectives is to share information across state boundaries. That happens there. You can find contact lists on, uh, on that website. You can send questions. You can initiate surveys. You'll find uh, specifications and, and a whole treasure trove of other information there, including yeah. past presentations. Uh, I really want to thank you, Neil and, and Dennis, and those folks that have uh, elected to stick with us. Um, through this presentation, a lot of really good information. If you have questions, like Neil said, reach out to one of us and feel free to uh, to send those to us. If you have uh, anything that you need to, to let us know about, that would be great. We will be uh, conducting conferences like we have. One of, one of the major things that happens within the program is we have regional and national conferences where state DOT fleet managers get together and uh, network, um, see presentations, talk to each other about, about common interests and, and uh, issues that are happening. Um, every other year in even numbered years are the, is the national conference. Uh, we kind of had a wrench thrown into it with COVID, um, but in, in 2022, we are in the process of organizing a national conference in Florida this year. Uh, so stay tuned for that. If you're not aware of that, that will be happening. Uh, we don't have a venue or a date just yet, but we will soon. So we'll get that word out to uh, participants and uh, well done. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.